All right, so um, it is the most exciting week um, for us is moving up to Easter. But what I hope you get uh, from this message as we look at it was this was a difficult week for Jesus and his disciples. Uh, it kind of all came to this, this climax. And so uh, this morning I thought we'd talk about uh, the idea, you know, whether or not God is real, the, the, the struggle that we have. Uh, can you trust God? I think that'll pop up there. Yeah, there it is. Can you trust God? Now, this is a pretty loaded question because I don't want you to misunderstand uh, what I think Jesus is asking his disciples and his followers. It's not, can God be trusted? Even though that certainly would be a part of it, but that's almost like an academic question or a philosophical question. Can God be trusted? The, the idea is, is, is uh, not that, it's can you trust God? Are you able to trust God? And that's, that's a difficult thing for us because trust was lost. It's not because God did something to betray us and that, you know, that may be how you look at it that way. It's, it's something was lost in the garden with our ability to trust God, to believe that God is capable and that God cares enough, he's compassionate enough. All that somehow gets lost in the struggle with, with us and God. Let me, let me put it this way. You, you've probably done this. You say, I've trusted somebody, right? Maybe it was your mom, your dad. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a relative. Maybe it was you know, a mate. I trusted somebody and they let me down and they betrayed me. So my trust is what? It's gone, yeah. So I'm not gonna trust anybody again. In fact, it's one of the things that, that we struggle with with Jesus. I know you and I don't think about it that much, but 2,000 years ago, they went through the same things. Can I really trust? And uh, Jesus is in the form of a man. So, you know, that reminds me of men or women, people who have let me down before, who I could not trust before. And then the, the default is I'm only going to trust who? Me. I'm the only one that I'm going to trust. And it puts us in a, in a difficult uh, uh, place in life. In fact, uh, I, I put on here in the outline uh, for you, um, the, the question is, can you trust that God is both capable and that God cares enough to keep his promises, to do the things that he said that he was going to do? Is he capable? Can he do those things? And does he care enough to actually follow through on those things and do the things? that? Because those are the two places that that, that we struggle as far as trust is concerned anyway. Yes, somebody told me, you know, I'm gonna do this for you, I'm gonna help you out, I will never leave you, you know, and, and, and they're just not capable, that's part of it. You know, they're, they're making promises that they're not capable of keeping. Or sometimes, you know, someone will say something to you, make a promise to you, and you realize later, yeah, they made that, they said that, but they didn't really care that much for me because it all fell apart. I've done this with my kids before, they'll tell you this, um, you know, I don't know if, if this is advised, but I, you, know, you wanna say to your kids when you're growing up, I will always be there for you. Anybody do that with your kids? Yeah, and then I got to the point where I said, okay, I will not always be there for you. Oh, great, thanks, Dad, that really, you know, so, but I'm just trying to be straightforward with them. I can't make that promise because I'm not capable of keeping that promise, which is one of the reasons why I wanted them to understand there is a heavenly father who can keep that promise. There is someone who loves them so much that he can make that promise and he can keep it. And actually he cares even more than I do, which, which I'm the one that has a hard time struggling with. How could that be? Because I love my kids and I would do anything for my kids. You know, so it, it's hard to understand that God even cares more than we care and God is capable. God can do it. But that's a hard thing for us, a hard thing to, uh, to come to. And as we look at this uh, last week of Jesus' life, I think there's something else that you're gonna see that that's the conflict that arises up in your outline, trying to trust this, this idea that God is capable and he cares will bring conflict between your capabilities and God's because your natural tendency is to trust in what you can do, how you see it, what, what you have decided um, you're gonna count on in your life and you're gonna struggle with, okay, I see it the way I see it, but if God sees it differently, can I really, can I really trust in that? I had a friend, Years and years and years ago, he was speaking. I still remember, it jumps out to me. He said, here's our struggle. And he was talking to people as Christians. Our struggle is we say, God, I'm with you. I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, you can depend on me. You just tell me, you know, where we're gonna go and I'll do it. But, um, oh, but 
tell me ahead of time so I can decide if I wanna go. You know, so yeah, that's, that's our struggle because I may say I'll do that and then God comes up with something and we come like, well, it really wasn't you know, what I was thinking, it wasn't really my idea of how this should, should work. So this is the last week of Jesus' life that we're gonna look to. We call this uh, Palm Sunday or sometimes this is called Passion Week and it, it's such a powerful week for Jesus and it's such a powerful week for Christianity and, and for the world. And, and at the time, they had, they had no idea what they, were, what they were facing, but Jesus did. He, he knew exactly what was happening and what was uh, about to happen to him, how difficult it would be, how painful it would be, how stressful it would be. And, and let me add this also. Jesus also understood something that hopefully you and I don't ever have to understand or have to believe. Jesus knew that the success of it, the weight of it, it was all on, not his disciples. <laughs> it's a good thing because they, they struggled. Not, not on the religious community in Jerusalem, not on Judaism, not on the Jews, not on the world leaders. He knew that the weight of all of it rested on who? Jesus himself. It was all on him. He had to do this. He, had to, he came for a, a purpose, for a reason. It was all on him now to fulfill what he had done. In, in a sense, as he's going in, this is a proclamation that the king has arrived. The ruler of the universe has shown up, and that's why you're gonna see a lot of symbols in this. But all of the weight of the success of it and all that he was gonna go through, and it was gonna be difficult for everybody, but really difficult for him, rested on him. That's why I put in your uh, outline as we look at these passages for Jesus. Now was the time and now was the place for him to secure our salvation. And it was all on him. So every gospel records uh, this week. In fact, most of the, um, uh, in John especially, I mean, these, these last weeks are the huge bulk of what he writes about it. In all the gospels, you see all this. You see different details. Um, some of the details uh, are, seem slightly different from the other because you gotta remember, you got four different views catching things and, and this is what's important. No, this is what's important. But if you put it all together, it's a, it's a powerful and amazing week and we can actually, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm gonna hit three of the gospels for you uh, quickly. I promise you'll be out by three o'clock or so. And so um, here's, here's how we start. You, you shouldn't laugh at that. I might do. No, okay, here we go. I know you're saying, well, I'm gonna be out of here. Before. Okay, this is the gospel of John. And if you go to the 12th chapter of the gospel of John, here's how it starts. It says, Six days before Passover celebration. I underline that because this is the time. He knows this. This is the week. This is it. Six days before the Passover celebration. Catch this. Jesus arrived. He shows up. He knows this is the place. He's going to Jerusalem. Um, this is the place that it's going to take place. In fact, I love this. It's one of my favorite parts of the story. He's, he's letting the disciples know he's going back to Jerusalem. And the disciples know this is not a good idea. They want to kill you there. Already they were determined and, and he had to leave before because of the danger of it. Why would we want to go back to Jerusalem? That, that, that's a mistake. Not only do they try to talk him out of it, they, you know, even some of the disciples tried to convince him that they were smarter than he was. You, know, you don't understand how it works. Let me tell you what you should do. And then my favorite is all of a sudden they kind of take on the Eeyore you know, of uh, Winnie the Pooh. They go like, okay. He's determined he's going down there and he's gonna die, so we might as well go and die with him. Let's go. You know, you, have you ever been like that? Yeah. They were, they were dedicated to go, but they didn't think that this was a good idea or this would uh, turn out well, but Jesus was determined because he knew this is his time and his place. And so he says he arrived in Bethany. So I don't know if the map, they're gonna put a map up for me, they told me. Here we go, there it is. Okay, let's see if Bethany is on the map. Can you see, does anybody see Bethany? There's no Bethany on the map, that's all right. But um, in fact, I'm trying to find, where are we on the map on there? This map is really confusing to me. Oh, there's Jerusalem, it's in the middle. No wonder I couldn't find it. There's Jerusalem. So let me show you, uh, this is, if, if you're, if you're uh, this is the Jordan River on the side where you see Jerusalem there, that's the Dead Sea. And uh, as someone helped me, the, the Dead Sea is about, 1,500 feet below sea level. So if you're crossing, you're coming down from the, from, uh, the Jordan and you go toward Jerusalem, you will go through Bethany and uh, uh, 
uh, Bethphage, another city that it mentions in the Gospels Jesus went through. And Jerusalem is like 2,500 feet above sea level. So it's about a 4,000 foot rise as you're walking up. And that's important to understand. As he's walking with them and going to this uh, city, he's going up to, that's why it will say he went up to Jerusalem. It's not about north and south. It's because they're going up a hillside and up, uh, up a mountain. So uh, he arrived in Bethany, the home of, here we go, a guy that's pretty important, the home of who? Lazarus. So you, you, you remember Lazarus? Lazarus was a guy that died. He's in the grave. And Jesus comes and raises him from the, from the grave. And Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, are really good friends of Jesus. So it says, uh, uh, he came to their home. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. And of course, Martha, she's the one serving. She's the one preparing. Because if you remember the story of Mary and Martha, Martha is the detailed one. She's the one that gets everything done. Uh, Mary is very different from her sister, uh, Martha, and you'll see this even in the story. Martha served. Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. It was probably oil of olay, but it was something, you know, like that, that, uh, that was very fragrant and uh, very expensive. They're going to talk about a year's salary to buy this, and, and this family was, had means to them, so, uh, and they had always... Uh, uh, done well or had money. And so she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And then it says this. This is great. The house was filled with the fragrance. Now, I know you say, well, yeah, of course. I mean, you might not even like the fragrance, but, you know, it's going to be filled with the fragrance of whatever she was using. See, I, I think it's a word picture, just to let you know. I think it's a word picture of a family, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who trusted Jesus. They loved Jesus, um, they followed him, uh, they were prepared. This is one of those things that even as he's traveling, apparently they knew he was on his way and they had prepared. Martha was ready for him with this dinner to celebrate him, who he was, and his disciples as they came. This is the picture of, of people's lives, the people who say, we trust him, we, we believe him. Now, did they fully understand it? No, of course not, but there was this fragrance in the home, in the room. They were excited, they're happy, they're filled with hope. Jesus is here. Man, they, they have planned on this. They, can't, they couldn't wait for him to come. And by their actions and their attitudes, everything about them, you're like, yeah, I get it, I understand it. Then there's a contrast. Because right after that, this is what it says, uh, the writer uh, John says. He says, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would, say this with me, he would what? Soon betray him, yeah. The disciple who would soon betray him. Je Jesus picked Judas to be a part of the 12. So did he know? Yeah, he knew. But he was gonna be the one who betrayed him. Is, is Judas gonna be a picture? He's there in the midst of all this. Is he gonna be a picture of the same fragrance? No, actually he's not. Look at what it says. He's, he's, he says, that perfume is worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor, anybody think good idea to give to the poor? Sure, you know, and, and, but here's, here's the issue. Is that really what was motivating um, Judas? Well, he actually says, not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. It's a, it's a picture of someone who did not trust Jesus. Now, I know you may say, because I've, I've read some people even in modern day who now want to say, but wait a minute, Judas was, no. Ju Judas was not someone who trusted Jesus. Jesus chose him. He picked him to be one of his followers. But Judas did not. Judas was kind of in hiding in the midst of that. In fact, Judas will sell Jesus. He will go to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and for 30 pieces of silver, he says, I will disclose him to it so that you can deal with him. He regretted it, but he still is selling Jesus because he doesn't look at Jesus and say, I trust him, I trust what he's gonna do, I don't understand it all, but I tr that is not Judas. And I, I like this because all of us have sort of this struggle within us. There, I think in, within, within all of us, there's, there's a part of us that's kind of like Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and there may be a part of us that's kind of like Judas that I, well, you know, I need to look out after myself. And, and so you have to make a decision. You have to decide, do you trust him or do you not trust him? 
And it's an important decision for everybody to make because God sends Jesus into the world. He goes through all this because he wants to try to convince you that you should trust him, not because you can predict it, not because he does everything you want. It's going to be painful for the disciples and the ones who trusted him also because they're gonna go through this. They're gonna go through difficult times. Even, even uh, Paul will later write that, that it's an honor for him, that's how he viewed it, to suffer for the one who suffered for me. That, that's a, I know you may say it's a strange way to look at life. Not if you trust him. Not if you trust him because you know whatever I go through, even the difficult things that I go through, God is faithful in those, he has a plan for those, and that's not the end of the story. So even Jesus last week, he can go through this. He can go through this, it says, because of the joy that he knew was before him would come afterwards. That was the rescue of us. So he was willing to go through all of these pains and all these struggles uh, for us. But it didn't start out that way. And I'm sure that the disciples are pretty much saying at this point, hey, this is looking a lot better than Jesus said. You know, he told us what would happen, but man, it's actually working out pretty good because in verse number nine, it says, when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus also. Yeah, because he's the problem. <laughs> if we get to rid of him, there's no proof that, uh, that you can trust Jesus or you can believe in him. He says, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and were now following Jesus. So there was this jealousy that they had of him. It says um, that, that they had this motive um, that they were dealing with, they were struggling with. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And then if you jump, this is in uh, Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 19. I'm gonna jump around between three of the go different gospels. Uh, this is what it says in verse 37 of chapter 19. When they reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had uh, seen. So let me, let me pull the map back up again also for you. Can y'all give me that map one more time? There, there it is. So as, as they're coming, up, or coming down to Jerusalem, but they're actually going up uh, the hill to Jerusalem, they're gonna come to this hillside that is called the Mount of Olives. And as you walk up the hillside to the Mount of Olives, you can't actually see Jerusalem, which is Mount Moriah. So it, it, it goes down after that and then goes back up and there's a, there's a bayou in there, kind of a, a stream you know, at times of the year called the Kidron. And, uh, and it's, it's close, so when you get uh, on top of the Mount of Olives or you're on the side of the Mount of Olives where the garden uh, is, you can see Jerusalem. But at this point coming up, you can't but you can hear. So if they're singing and shouting and there's a crowd singing and shouting and going with him and traveling with him and they're praising God, you can hear the crowd in Jerusalem. You'd be like, what is going on? And maybe someone would say, Jesus is coming. He's coming this way. There's a whole crowd with him. Oh, incidentally, there's gonna be a conflict in Jerusalem and, and the ones who, I know sometimes people say how quickly the crowd turns, yes, but it might not be the same crowd. Because the crowd coming with Jesus up the Mount of Olives are pilgrims from the countryside and other places who are traveling there for Passover. And they are all excited when they see him. Uh, they, they've seen him do miracles. They've heard him uh, say things. Man, they are, they're just pumped to be with him. In Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem are under the control a lot more of the religious leaders who oversee and who rule in Jerusalem. So are some of them the same people? Could be, we don't know really. Um, but it, it's clear that those traveling are coming as pilgrims to Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover. So they come to the Mount of Olives. And a year ago, we were in uh, Jerusalem. And I, you know, it still brings me back to what I thought was the most memorable part of the trip and that was being in the Mount of Olives, being on that hillside and looking over the Kidron uh, Valley and seeing Jerusalem there and the temple and all that. I mean, it's still, to me, just stunning, the view that is there as, as they would come over that. In fact, it even says in one of the Gospels, as Jesus gets to this point where he's looking at Jerusalem, it says that he weeps for Jerusalem because he knows what's, what's coming, what's gonna happen. And they don't get it. 
They, they don't understand who has arrived, what he's come to do, and just the magnitude of the fact that their king has now been announced, the king they've waited for, the king who would give his life for them and who by giving his life would absolutely set them free, but they don't get it. And he weeps for them. Um, it, it hurts to know this, but at this point, they're celebrating with him. So one of the things that happens in the stories, all of them tell this, is as Jesus is coming, he sends his disciples uh, into one of the cities, is either uh, Bethany or Bethphage, and he says, when you go there, uh, you'll walk in and you get to the street and you'll see a, a donkey tied up. One of the other uh, writers says, a donkey and her colt tied up. And he says, so untie them and bring them to me. And um, you know, you're thinking, okay, if you're a disciple, you know, have you talked to them before? How do you know this? But it's one of those things that helps them to realize there's something going on. He's got some sort of plan, and it's amazing that he knows this because they go in the city, and sure enough, there it is. And it's, 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 it's a donkey and her colt there, and they untie him. And of course, if you untie somebody's donkey and their colt, what's gonna happen? Somebody's gonna show up and, uh, and say, hey, what are you doing? Is that yours? What do you? And he says, when, when they do that, he says, just say to them, the master has need. He, they untie, they come, they, hey, that, that's not, what are you doing? Well, the master has need. And they say, okay. And they're stunned by it. Of course they are. What do you mean, okay? Let me steal your vehicle. Let me, you know, this is like, they just let us walk off with it. And as they bring it, which I think this is pretty stunning too, as they bring it, it's the colt that Jesus rides. Not, not the, the uh, adult, um, it's the cult. And it's, it's all part of Old Testament prophecy and the way kings at times uh, in those days would announce that they are the new king and ride in. Jesus is on the cult. In fact, it says that one of them just throws his garment over the cult and he rides it. There's no bridle, there's no reins, there's no saddle with a, you know, if you ever learned to ride with a horn on it, a Western saddle where I can hold on so I won't fall off. They just throw, a, throw a, a cloak over it and it doesn't try to throw him off. And you know they've gotta be, st this, no one has ever ridden this animal before and it lets him ride. And he comes in and they're throwing their cloaks on the ground, on the trail as he's coming in. And they're cutting uh, palm branches and they're waving them and throwing them down and they're singing about their king has come in fact I know Michael W. Smith had to be there because if you ever heard Michael W. Smith you know he sings that song blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord oh, you've heard it Hosanna 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 and Hosanna means when they're singing Hosanna sorry I can't sing that high Michael I don't know why he does it but anyway you know when they're singing Hosanna you know what Hosanna means Save us, save us now. So we sing Hosanna because it's really cool. You know, it sounds good to sing Hosanna. But they're singing out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, save us now, rescue, because that's what they wanted. Save us from Rome. <laughs> save us from our struggles. Save us from our, our, our circumstances, our poverty, our illness, yes. And was Jesus going to save them from all those things? He was, just not in the way that they thought. First, he was gonna pay a price to free them from the debt that they own, owed that was on their lives because of their own sin. That's the part they didn't quite understand. And I, I tell you, I think that that's pretty typical for us, isn't it? Don't you want God just to fix the things that you want fixed and fix them the way that I want them fixed, right? How many people, let's be honest, how many people prayed yesterday that your team would win their game in March Madness and NCAAs. Come on, let me, have, let me have anybody. Did you pray for your team? How many people think when you prayed and you asked God that people on the, that pull for the other team were not praying also? <laughs> so you, you can't have it both ways, right? And, uh, and is God's purpose for that? No, but, but that is the way we see it. That is the way we struggle with it and, and the way that we think about it. And, and the disciples, thought, they did also. Listen, if, if you know the story, you know that when Jesus is falsely accused, he goes before three different trials, he ends up being sent to the Roman, he's, he's moved around with the Romans also, all in a day's time. It's brutal, he is, he is whipped, he is beaten, everything he has is taken away from him. It looks really bad for him. So are the disciples and all those who follow him just there with him? No, they run away, of course. They don't get it, they don't understand. Can we trust him? He's not even winning the fight, right? 
How can we trust him? What they didn't understand is he is winning the fight. And you're going to see that in uh, this passage, why Jesus uh, was winning the fight or what he did in one sense to show, to prove that he knew that he was uh, winning the fight. But let me finish up. This is uh, Luke 19. They're singing blessing, uh, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd in verse 39 said, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, if they kept quiet, don't you like this? The stones along the road would do what? They'd burst into cheers. <laughs> They'd start singing. Now, just me, um, I don't know if this is wrong or not. I kind of wish that they had stopped, you know, so because I mean, I think, wouldn't that have been amazing just to see the inanimate things, you know, also lift up because this is who he is. And no matter what the people say or don't say, it's not gonna change who he is and uh, what he has come to do. Here is a, this is called a messianic part of a psalm, Psalm 118. So for the Jews, there are parts in the psalms or in, in uh, different prophecies that would not, uh, they would realize they're not applying to the situation right now. They're applying to further down the road when, when the Messiah would come. And so they're called that. And this is one of those in Psalm 118. Listen to this. It says in verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the what? The cornerstone. So again, it's a word picture. So Jesus is the stone as a leader, as the one who came in the name of the Lord, that the Pharisees and, and in Jerusalem, they reject. They say, no, he's not our king. We're, we're not going to look at him that way. They reject him because in their view, he didn't fit what they wanted. Now, that's what you would do with a cornerstone. If you're looking for a cornerstone, you'd look for a, a stone that you say, man, this is perfect. It's cut perfectly. We've shaped it perfectly. The cornerstone is not the foundation. Um, you, you, you lay the cornerstone when you, when you build a building, and from the cornerstone, its angles, its shapes and all, everything is measured to lay the foundation, to place the foundation, but it's all keyed on this one stone to how it's gonna be laid and which direction it's gonna go and how it's been, and then you build upon that. And that's what they're saying. The, the cornerstone is rejected, but that, that stone that was rejected has become, another place will say, the chief cornerstone. It, it, there's a foundation still to be laid, but Jesus is the one that will determine the, the scope, the direction, uh, the magnitude of everything that is done because of who he is. Then it says in the next verse, verse 23, it says, this is the Lord's doing. And it is wonderful to see. I even think, man, even as they're going through this, they might not have looked at any of this as wonderful to see and wonderful to go through. But don't you know that later they look back at it in an entirely different way, right? You ever recorded a game? It's your team. Um, you didn't get a chance to watch the game. I know you've done this. You recorded it. You found out that you won, and then you go back to watch the recording. If you find out you're a loss, I know you, 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 you erased it. You didn't, I'm not watching that game. But you find out that your team won, you go back and you watch the game again, and, and because you know the outcome, because you know how it's gonna turn out, you know, you watch it, and the other team makes good plays, or your team, your players make bad plays, and it just doesn't bother you, right? In fact, it's kind of part of the drama of it and the wonder of it. Why? Because you know how it ends. You know when it's done, your team wins. That's what's going on. And as they look back, even at these details, that they write down all the details, even the details that make them look bad, they write them all down because they know, yeah, but we know how it ends. We know the, 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 the climax of this story and it's worth going through it and even going through the drama of it and even the struggles of it because of the way it end, and ends. And then it says this in verse 24. This is a great verse. Says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will what? We will rejoice and we will be, yeah. Now, I know when people do this, I've done this before, you may get up in the morning in fact, I've seen you know, preachers do this before on Sunday morning, go, this is the day that the Lord has made. Somebody will probably pull up a clip of me doing that, and I'll get in a lot of trouble. You know, so, and they're talking about this, this, this day. And I understand, new day, you know, it's a new opportunity. You know, I got some sleep. The kids didn't keep me up that much last night. You know, it's, it's just a great opportunity. But that's not what he's talking about. That's not what in the Psalms he's talking about. He's talking about 
this day, when Jesus goes and this, this week that he's going to go through all this suffering and struggle and he will endure it, he will carry it all on himself, he will not fail in this task that he has been given because he knew this is his time, his day, and his place to fulfill what the Father had decided ahead of time he would come to do. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Not because everything that happened we liked. We understood, we understand now what this day meant and what this day did for us when Jesus sacrificed his life so that we could be free from our sins. It's just incredible. And even as we look back at it, we realize this is the day. And there's another coming when Jesus will return again and it will be a day of rejoicing also. But he's referring to this day. So um, in Jerusalem though, the Pharisees and the religious leaders who were there, they have a different idea of how they want this to end. And so let me read, this is uh, Mark chapter 15. I'm gonna read 15 verses here pretty fast for you just to let you get a, a taste of how they saw it and how they are able to, in, the, in that moment, turn it. Here's what it says in verse one. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders and the teachers of the religious law, the entire high council, they met to discuss their next step. They, they bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, well, you have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer them, you know, answer to these accusations? What about all these charges that are being brought against you, that they're bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's he was surprised. He was shocked. You're not going to try to defend yourself? You're not going to try to hurl accusations against them? Most people, that's, that's what they would do. That was not what Jesus came to do. So he remained silent. In verse 6, it says, Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. So this would be very hard for Rome to let this guy go because this is a really, really bad guy. And for the most part, this would probably be really hard for the Jews also because he was a really, really bad guy even among, among their people. But in verse eight, it says, the crowd went to Pilate and asked uh, him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews, Pilate asked? For he realized by now that the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. But it is um, at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asks, then what should I do with this man? You call the king of the Jews. And they shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? Now he's talking about a crime against Rome. The Jews uh, were accusing Jesus of blasphemy. It wasn't because Jesus had stolen or murdered or anything like that. They had all kind of trumped up charges, but it was the blasphemy. They, they were fine with Jesus being a human being coming as a Messiah to help do something, but to claim that he was God, and Jesus often pointed to and claimed that he was divine, that he was from God, that they could not deal with and that they could not um, put up with. They, had to, they felt like they had to find a way then to destroy him. Um, but the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate's a politician, right? Pilate understands he's in charge, he has the Roman army behind him, but he also has to deal with Rome themselves and those who are above him. And he knows, don't let the crowd get out of control. Don't have any problems because he might have to answer to this. And he knows to play the crowd. He hasn't broken a law, but, you know, I need to pacify the crowd. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead tip whipped. Then he turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be what? Crucified. And at that moment, listen. If you're one of those who is a follower, 
and you've been trying to trust Jesus, man, you're in conflict. Boy, I, I, I thought we were gonna win this. And even, you know, later they come back and they, and they realize, no, he did tell us this is what was gonna happen. But that's only after Jesus is raised from the grave that they, that they realize this because then the victory is actually won. But at this point, they're not there yet. It has not happened yet. And humanly, humanly, okay, Jesus, trust him. What about the power of the religious leaders and those they've already stirred up in Jerusalem? That You're not gonna take that into account? What about the power of Rome and Pilate? What, what about politics? What about soldiers? What about, you know, you have to take the reality of that into account. Here's the question, but do you trust, can you trust, can you believe that what Jesus is doing is even more powerful than what the religious leaders are doing, what Rome is doing? Can you believe that it's more powerful from the, than the politics that is being played out or the threat of death that Rome is certain to enact to bring about fear because that's how they ruled, by causing you to fear them. Do you believe that God's love and God's compassion is greater than the fear you should have with Rome? Do you believe God is capable of doing what he has promised by sending us a king a new ruler whom we can trust and who absolutely will take care of our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it's a tough story, but for a reason, because our lives are tough also and the things that we have to go through and endure are, are sometimes overwhelming to us. And we thank you that even what they face seemed absolutely Overwhelming, even though we know the end of the story. We know how it finishes. And in that sense, Lord, I know that we should know the end of our story also, but so many times we don't. We, we struggle with, we wish we could see it. We wish we could, could already experience the good part of it and not go through the difficult part. If you're here this morning and maybe you're questioning and struggling with who Jesus himself is, is he someone that I can trust with my life, my circumstances, my relationships, knowing that he's faithful? Can I be like Mary and Martha and Lazarus and say, knowing what I know and what I've seen, I'm just gonna trust him even though I know I will face difficult times. If, if you've never put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, that's actually the whole point of his life. And the whole point of us being able to read about that life 2,000 years later and all the details of it. So many times, even the agonizing details because we can relate. We can relate. And just as they believed him and trusted in him 2,000 years ago, we can trust in him because we do know the end of the story and the outcome. If you've never put your hope and your trust in him or maybe you're here and, and you're just looking for a new hope, maybe there was a time where you said, I was, I was so much closer, so much closer to Jesus, but now it just seems like it's so hard to hang on. What a wonderful time. This last week before we celebrate Easter, to look to God and say, God, I know life is gonna be hard. I know you never promised that you would just make it easy and for it to all work out my way. But your promise through Jesus was that you would never forsake me and let go of me and you would never stop loving and caring for me. I want that, I wanna hold on to that. So Lord, would you draw me close to yourself? Would you speak to me, teach me? Show me your ways. Fill me with a, a new life, a new spirit, how I long to have the same approach to life that Mary and Martha and Lazarus had. In Jesus' name I pray.